And for legalization. Legalization. Yes. We can. It's time for the Russ Belleville Show's Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Dr. Earlywine is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and a leading author and researcher on cannabinoids and health who pins the Ask Dr. Mitch column for High Times Magazine. Get your questions ready in our live chat or call in to 971-533-7111 now. All right, everybody, welcome to Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch. This segment is brought to you by Wood Pipes, smoke shop and speakeasy in Wisconsin. And welcome back, Dr. Mitch. Great to be here. Uh, so great to have you here. We got a few questions that are building up in our chat room. If you got a question, make sure you get on chat or call us live at 971-533-7111. Heck, you don't even have to call us live. You can call us 24 hours a day. We got a voicemail. You can leave a voicemail question for Dr. Mitch if you like. But before we get to the questions, we always start giving Dr. Mitch the first word for the latest in cannabis science. What's up, Dr. Mitch? Well, uh, interesting website that Trickster Phillips forwarded to me with some misinformation about cannabis and pregnancy. I'm not a fan of cannabis use during pregnancy unless it's uh, no other nausea drug seems to be doing the trick, but there's a lot of alarmist stuff out there. What we do know is one data set suggests that uh, kids exposed to cannabis uh, in utero were more likely to have ADHD at age 6 and 10, but they never measured ADHD in the mom, so we really don't know if that was causal or not. And then we have seen an increase in uh, visits to the NICU in cannabis using moms, but uh, we're talking about something that's so incredibly rare that it would only have to increase uh, a little bit to make it look like, oh, it's went from 1% to 2%. And they say, yeah, it doubled. So again, I, I'm not a fan of the use during pregnancy, but there aren't a ton of data to suggest that this is some kind of detrimental, outrageous horror thing. Now on that uh, information on ADHD, is there indication that ADHD is something that does have a genetic component to it that would pass from mother to child? <laughs> In fact, ADHD is highly heritable. We do see a father to son uh, heavier loading in some of the genetic studies, but uh, clearly there does seem to be a genetic component. Okay, so let me get to one of our questions from the chat room, and this is coming from Doe Link, who asks, uh, he read some articles regarding dry mouth and cannabis, one by a dental hygienist that uh, suggested that this was a, a, a terrible, terrible thing. He's pro-marijuana, and my dentist says users are at risks, risk for caries caused by activation of endocannabinoid receptors of the salivary glands. I don't know if he means cavities or what caries might be, but what do we know about dry mouth and dental health? Yeah, caries does mean cavities, and there was uh, one uh, study suggesting increased rates of some uh, gum receding and gum bleeding in folks who are regular cannabis users, but I honestly don't think it has anything to do with cannabis and a lot more to do with uh, falling asleep after an indica and eating raw cookie dough. <laughs> the other big issue uh, seems to be just heat, and obviously I'm not a fan of those little uh, metal one-hitters that are going to make a whole lot of heat come into your mouth. So again, your vaporizer is your friend. Anything to, to keep the vapor cool is going to be a little easier on your mouth, but we're talking about some really minor effects compared to uh, the more important things like making sure you brush and floss. What are, what are some of the ways, in, in addition to that, that regular cannabis users would be most successful in defeating dry mouth? Uh, I, I, I don't imagine candy or mints are necessarily a good idea with the sugar and all. I mean, the curious thing is this is such an advantage for uh, folks who, uh, it's, it sounds funny, but folks with MS in late stages who have problems with drooling really appreciate the dry mouth. So mm. it's one person's symptom is another person's cure. But the clincher, is, as, as banal as it sounds, is just having a glass of water right there. Uh, the, the mints and things like that seem to be, uh, you know, an invitation to some, some gum and, and tooth problems. And water is so accessible now, why not, why not go for it? Everybody seems to uh, have one of those hip filter bottles. Uh, when I was in L.A., it was almost... Uh, so cool that if you didn't have one, you were kind of looked down on. What about the uh, products out there that claim to quench thirst, you know, the Gatorades and Powerades that claim to replace electrolytes and such? I mean, the clincher on that is uh, you do lose some electrolytes, but unless you're working out really heavy duty, like unless you're going to be out in the sun for more than an hour or you're going to be exercising uh, really hardcore for more than an hour, uh, odds are high water is really the thing you need the most 
and that this is a rather expensive way of getting those electrolytes. So they certainly don't seem to do much harm. Uh, they're also a lot more caloric than some of them let on. So uh, you think you're doing something good for yourself and realize you just quaffed another 250 calories and it kind of can defeat the point of the workout for yeah, some good folks. Good point. Metagro Vermont has a good question. This is referring to, I believe, most recently on the Katie Couric program, where Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who's also had been a CNN contributor. Now, I remember Dr. S Dr. Gupta saying some pretty negative things about cannabis not four or five years ago. Apparently, he's been having some good things to say about it recently. Have you been following on Dr. Gupta's uh, television pronouncements any and anything you can tell us about him? So literally, even two years ago, he was saying just absolutely ridiculous anti-cannabis things. And then this last time on Katie Couric, apparently he said something moderately positive, but I'm so biased against him, I couldn't even encode what it was. <laughs> okay, apparently he's got some documentary on cannabis coming up in August, so we'll uh, watch for that and we'll get your reaction after that. Here's a good question okay. from uh, John Thomas. Uh, it says, new research shows that THC can help prevent heart attacks and improve recovery after one. Is there any reason to believe an average marijuana consumer would not obtain this benefit? So this is a curious thing because one big review suggests, in fact, this is problematic for cardiac health. And then the, the antioxidant properties make it seem obvious that this should be helpful. So I'm, I'm mistrusting a little bit on each side. The mechanisms uh, sound compelling in, in each direction. Uh, THC tends to increase heart rate. In fact, you know, smoking cannabis tends to increase heart rate. So if you have a problem with rhythm, uh, any kind of cardiac arrhythmia, things like that, that may be something uh, that could put you at risk for problems. But in contrast, the, uh, all the cannabinoids really have these interesting antioxidant effects that tend to minimize some of the damage that can be done to cardiac muscle and cardiac tissue in general. Uh, when, you know, when you're exposed to extreme aging and things like that. So it seems like this would be a, 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 at least a break-even, if not a modest benefit. But any of these big lung buster hits where you're holding your breath a lot and uh, feeling your heart rate uh, increase really rapidly, that's really just a poor use of cannabis. All right. Here's a story that we got from our headlines today, and it was from uh, HIV and Hepatitis.com. A study showing that marijuana did not promote liver disease progression in people co-infected with HIV and Hep C. And I'm wondering, Dr. Mitch, why would they even wonder about that? I thought marijuana was not toxic to the liver. Why would they even think that it would cause a promote liver disease? I mean, the funny thing about this is that uh, they're so in search of some negative that uh, this uh, this was funded before things were so clear that the liver disease issue was really not an issue. And it's unfortunate, but people are still getting denied liver transplants if they're cannabis users. And that is just so wrong and so idiotic. So I was happy to see that there was a journal that was willing to put this out in part just to help buttress arguments for liver transplants for folks who are uh, medical cannabis users. But also the combination of HIV and Hep C, I mean, it's, it's just such a horrible double whammy. And so they didn't want to overgeneralize uh, from folks who didn't have HIV to folks who do have HIV. And it was just reassuring to see that it, this, is, this is the case even in that sample. Yeah, and, and this you know, hits us here at the show so personally because of our, our friend Ganja John who had to go through transplants and you know had to you know, basically hide and, and jive his way through the system to be able to get that transplant. And another friend of ours uh, is Greg DeHote, a.k.a. Cannabis Cure, out there in the U.K. He came to the U.S. as a Crohn's patient uh, and just in haggard shape when I first met him. His latest show, he's talked about how it seems his disease has gone into remission. He suffers from Crohn's disease. And last week we did a story from the uh, journal, it came from the Journal of Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology saying that uh, marijuana could possibly cure Crohn's disease. Uh, what are you finding on that front, Dr. Mitch? And uh, I, th I think it's right. I, you know, Greg looks great. <laughs> I mean, my, my looks at that literature are not as encouraging as these really heartfelt responses I've been getting on both Facebook and uh, via email. When you think about uh, at least some of the precursors to it, so uh, we've got compelling data with irritable bowel syndrome, which has some of the same sort of symptoms. Uh, curiously, I have a number of people who've been emailing me who suggest that when they quit smoking cigarettes, some of the symptoms flare up, and it takes about a month for some of that stuff to die down. So there may be some... Uh, basically commingling of some of those same uh, issues. 
when you see some of the vascular effects of, of the cannabinoids, it might make some sense, but we, we just don't have the randomized clinical trial yet. So I am so delighted about our pal over in the UK because, I mean, he really was not doing well and seems to be categorically better. We do know that uh, it's got to be combined with a lot of the things that also help. So an appropriate attention to diet, mm-hmm. uh, an appropriate attention to some of the other medications that, that can be helpful, uh, some interesting evidence on curcumin, some other, basically some other plants that also seem to enhance some of these same flavonoids, terpenoids that might be the mechanism. And then by all means, let's, let's get those randomized clinical trials done because I really feel like uh, there's enough people suffering from this and they ought to have uh, access to the mess. We have a question here from Medigro in Vermont who says, insurance companies are changing a driver's rate when they find out you are a patient. And I assume they mean increasing and marijuana patient. Uh, have you seen this happen with any other patients nationwide? Uh, sad but true. There's talk about doing this for folks who are uh, chronically on the opiates. And, in fact, you develop tolerance to those and to the you know cognitive effects of cannabis. Uh, so I, I feel like it's kind of unfair because it, it's really uh, – just a modest correlation with uh, accident rates, and it seems like it's just so unjust to you know seek these people out and then somehow assume that their accident rates are going to be higher. And I haven't seen the actuarial data, but I can't imagine it's really that incrementally large. There were data to suggest that cigarette smokers were at uh, higher accident rates, and in part should have been uh, charged more for insurance, but it was actually because they were smoking cigarettes while they were driving and, you know, getting ashes on themselves and suddenly uh, ending up in a crash. So, I mean, I feel like it's completely, it's completely awry, one of these weird mathematical things that has, that has gone a, in a bad direction. All right. And finally, for our, our last question, again, last week we had a lot of science stories, and this one came from a place called truthonpot.com, it's a study on electroacupuncture on rats that found it kind of increased the endocannabinoid system, that this may be why acupuncture works. Had you ever heard of this acupuncture working because it stimulates endocannabinoids? Uh, no, but it's, it's, it's intriguing because we have seen other things where pain uh, the effect of other analgesics is not as good if you block the endocannabinoid system. So it kind of makes some sense that this was uh, a reasonable place to look. And I really do buy this. This was a decent sample size. They really did a good job as far as uh, how they constructed this argument. And so it does uh, suggest that in, in, a, in a way, uh, when acupuncture does work, it's uh, essentially endocannabinoid mediated. Wow. We are learning so much every month, every year here about the endocannabinoid system. Just a few years ago, we didn't even know it existed. Dr. Mitch, thanks for joining us. And folks, if you didn't get your question in for our cannabis Q&A, you can always send it by email. Go to our contact form at 420radio.org slash contact. Look for Ask Dr. Mitch in the drop down. Or you can send your email directly to 420research at gmail.com. Again, Dr. Mitch, thank you for being with us every Monday here on Cannabis Q&A. Thanks for everything, Russ. All right. When we come back, time for a radical rant, a little history lesson. We're taking a look at the origins of the word marijuana. Marijuana.